Welcome back to this course on the general linear model. Today we're talking about another advanced technique, which is interaction effects. Interaction effects occur any time that the effect of one predictor depends on the value of another predictor. So it is by definition a multiple regression technique, except this time the effects are not independent, but interactive. Let's have a closer look. First, we will recap what we've learned about the regression model. We can represent it as a formula where we can say that the dependent variable y for every individual sub i is a linear function of an intercept a plus a slope b times the individual values on the predictor variable x plus individual error terms epsilon sub i. We can also represent the regression equation as follows separating it into the predicted values, y with a hat on for every individual sub i, plus the individual prediction errors, epsilon sub i, and then we can say that the observed values, y sub i, are equal to the predicted values, y with a hat on sub i, plus individual prediction errors. Until today, we've already covered several extensions of the basic general linear model. We've covered bivariate linear regression, We've covered bivariate regression where the predictor is a binary dummy variable, which we can use to perform an independent samples t-test. We've covered multiple regression, including multiple regression where all of the predictors are dummy variables that code for membership of the same categorical variable with more than two categories. And this is how we can use the general linear model to perform an ANOVA test. And we've performed multiple regression where the predictors can be either binary or continuous, it doesn't matter. That's just the general case of multiple regression. So the last thing we did in this course is extending the bivariate regression model with additional building blocks, where each building block had the shape plus b times x, so plus a slope times a predictor. And we could add as many of these blocks as we wanted to. Every block represents an additional predictor. Today we're kind of adding a special kind of building block. It's similar but different, and that is the interaction effect. So we can define interaction as a situation where the effect of one predictor depends on the value of the other predictor. And to represent this, we can add a block that takes the form plus b times x1 times x2. So the two interacting variables are multiplied with one another, creating what we call a product term, because multiplication is also called taking the product. And that product term will have its own slope, which represents the strength and direction of the interaction effect. When would you use interaction? Well, let's look at a few applied examples. For example, in my country of the Netherlands, women still take on the brunt of child-rearing responsibilities, which can be operationalized as parental involvement. So as a researcher, you might hypothesize that progressive gender roles will predict greater involvement, particularly for men. This implies an interaction between the predictor gender roles and participants biological sex. So we have an interaction between a continuous variable, which is the scale gender roles, and a dummy variable representing whether the participant's sex is indicated as male or female. Another applied example of an interaction might be that the personality dimension of agreeableness predicts the number of friends, but only when it's combined with a high level of extroversion. So it's not sufficient to just be nice. You have to be nice and, in addition, seek out contact with other people in order to make more friends. To represent this interaction effect, you would calculate a product term between agreeableness and extroversion. Both of these are continuous variables and you can just add that product term to your model. A final example might be that treatment guidelines for heart failure are mostly based on men. Recently there's been a debate that some of the drugs commonly prescribed affect recovery in men and women differently. So if this is the case, you could study it by incorporating an interaction between treatment, for example, drug versus placebo, and biological sex, male versus female. Both of these are dummy variables, so you would be multiplying binary dummy variables 
with one another to get a product term. As I explained previously, to get an interaction term, we just take the two interacting variables, multiply them together, that gives us a product term, and we can add that product term to our regression model. In a formula that looks like this, so we see plus B3, that's the slope of the interaction effect, times x1 times x2, and that is the product term. You can simply calculate that product term by multiplying the two variables in your data editor. Then you can add it to your regression model, but you always have to include the two original variables that the product term is composed of. You can never include an interaction effect without also including its two constituent variables. We can represent an interaction effect with a box diagram. In previous lectures, we've used these box diagrams to represent the direction of causality. In this case, we think that both predictors x1 and x2 have an effect on the outcome y. And additionally, we have effect modification caused by the product term between x1 and x2. So technically, the correct way to represent this would be to have three boxes for predictor x1, predictor x2, and the product between x1 and x2. And all of these three boxes have arrows pointing to the outcome variable y. In practice, however, you will also often see the diagram on the right to represent interaction effects. And the diagram on the right betrays something about how the researcher interprets this interaction effect. Because in the diagram on the right, we see that the researcher says, well, x1 has an effect on y and the effect of x1 is being modified by the interacting variable x2. So, of course, the product of x1 times x2 is identical to the product of x2 times x1. That means that interactions are, by definition, symmetrical. So, if the effect of x1 on y depends on the value of x2, that also means that the effect of x2 on y depends on the value of x1. But in practice, researchers often interpret interaction effects as effect modification. So they will say, well, the main effect that I'm interested in is that of x1 on y, and it is being modified by the value of x2. And to better represent this, it's very common to use the diagram on the right, which shows this as kind of a T-junction. Let's have a look at what happens when continuous and binary variables interact. Consider the example where there is a difference in parental involvement between males, coded 0, and females, coded 1. To represent this difference, which is an independent samples t-test, we can use regression with a binary dummy predictor. And this regression will give us the mean level of involvement for males, that's the intercept A, and it will give us the difference in mean level of involvement between males and females, and that's the regression slope B. To get the mean level of involvement for females, we just add A and B together. Now imagine that in addition to this binary sex difference, there is also an effect of gender role attitudes, which is the continuous predictor X2. So we can just use multiple regression and expand the regression equation to represent this effect. Now we get a formula that says A plus B1 times X1 plus B2 times X2. And here A is the mean level of involvement for males who score zero on gender role. So that's controlling for gender role. B1 is the difference in mean level of involvement between males and females who score zero on gender roles. And B2 is the increase in involvement associated with a one-point increase in gender roles. Graphically, this regression model could look like this. So what we see is two parallel lines with equal slopes. So they are exactly equally steep because we just have one slope for the effect of gender roles. But we have two intercepts. So we see that males score a little bit lower on average than females. So the intercept of males is a bit lower than the intercept of females. But what if the reality looked like this? What if we see a ceiling effect of involvement for females? So we see that all women are kind of maxed out in terms of their involvement. 
Whereas for men, the ones with very traditional gender roles are hardly involved at all, but the ones with very progressive gender roles are highly involved. Well, if that were the case, we would not only expect different intercepts, but we would additionally expect different slopes. So here we see a high intercept for females, that's the red line, but a pretty flat slope for the effect of gender roles because they're already maxed out in terms of involvement. And we see a pretty low intercept for the males, but a positive slope for the effect of gender roles. How are those two different effects represented in our regression model with an interaction terms? Well, in a regression equation with an interaction term, the intercept A is the expected value for men who score zero on gender roles. B1 is the mean difference between men and women who score zero on gender roles. So in the previous picture, that difference was pretty large for people who scored zero on gender roles. Then B2 is the slope, the effect of gender roles for men. And B3 is the difference in the effect of gender roles between men and women. So if B2 is a positive slope, for men there's a positive effect of gender roles on involvement, then B3 must be negative to cancel out that positive effect that we saw for men and arrive at a near zero effect for women. We can see that this is the case if we fill out the formula. So remember that men scored zero on the dummy variable sex. So for men, we can fill out the formula by replacing every time we see x sub one, that's the dummy variable sex, replacing that with zero. So then we get a plus b1 times zero, so that is canceled out, plus b2 times x2, plus b3 times zero, times x2, and anything multiplied by zero goes to zero, so this whole term is cancelled out. So for men, the formula for the regression line is just a plus b2 times x2. But women score 1 on x sub 1, so for them we can fill out the value 1. So we get a plus b1 times 1 is b1, plus b2 times x2, plus b3 times 1 is b3 times x2. And we can group those terms. So for women, we get an intercept a plus b1 and a slope b2 plus b3 times x2. So the women get an extra bump on top of both the intercept and the slope. And of course, if we had coded men as 1 and women as 0, then men would have gotten this extra bump on top of their intercept and their slope. So let's try to get some intuition for how to interpret this formula, where we have an interaction between one binary variable and one continuous variable. So we have six situations here, and we could ask ourselves in these stylized examples, which parameters will likely be non-zero. So in image one, we see that for both groups, the regression slopes are completely flat, so they are likely to be zero. So we could say that the effect of B2 here, this is zero, and this is also zero because the lines are parallel. And we see that both groups have an intercept that's higher than zero. So probably A is a positive number. And both groups have about the same intercepts, so the effect of the dummy variable is going to be zero. In figure two, what we see is that probably both groups have an intercept that starts at about zero. So the intercept A is going to be zero. They both have the same intercept, so the effect of the dummy variable is going to be zero. They both have a positive slope, so the effect B2 is going to be positive. And they both have the same slope, so the effect of the interaction is going to be zero. In figure three, we see that one group has an intercept that starts at zero. So let's say that this intercept is equal to zero for the blue group. But the other group has a higher intercept, so the effect of the dummy variable is going to be positive and non-zero. Both groups have a positive effect of the continuous predictor x2, so b2 is going to be a positive number, and the two lines are parallel, so they both have the same effect of x2, so the interaction b3 is also going to be zero. In figure four, we see that the orange group has an intercept that's greater than zero, 
So let's say that A is the intercept for the orange group and that's a positive non-zero number. But the other group has an even higher intercept, so the effect of the dummy, B1, is also going to be a positive non-zero number. But both of them have flat and parallel effects of X2, so the effect of X2 is going to be zero and the interaction term is going to be zero. Now in the fifth picture we see that the blue line is probably going to have a zero intercept. So let's say that A is now the intercept for the blue group and that is zero. But the orange group has a higher intercept, so we're going to say that the effect of the dummy is a positive non-zero number. We also see that the effect for the blue group is positive, so B2 is going to be a positive non-zero number. And we see that the effect of the orange and we see that the effect of x2 for the orange group is negative. So the interaction term must be a negative number and must be larger than b2 because not only is the positive effect for the blue group cancelled out, but it even flips to a negative sign. Right? So we have to go from this positive line for the blue group to a negative line for the orange group. So the interaction term must not only cancel out the positive effect for the blue group, but even go further and push it into negativity. So what we know here is that B2 is a positive non-zero number and B3 is a negative number that's even bigger than B2. Finally, in the sixth picture, what we see is that the orange group has probably a non-zero intercept because they start above zero. The blue group starts even higher, so we have a positive effect of the dummy variable x1, so b1 is going to be a positive number. What we see is that the orange group has a flat line for the effect of x2, so their effect of x2 is going to be zero, so b2 is zero. And the blue group has a positive effect of x2, so they have a positive effect for the interaction term. And that is how you interpret the different parameters in a regression model with interaction. Another important topic in interaction effects are simple effects. If the interaction term is significant, that means that the effect of x1 depends on the value of x2. But of course, the question then presents itself, what is the effect of x1 on y for each of the levels of the dummy variable g? If we have a categorical moderator, as was the case for the preceding example, then there's a very easy trick to obtain the effect of the continuous predictor for every level of the categorical predictor. For a categorical predictor with k categories, all you have to do is create k dummy variables, so one dummy for every category, instead of the usual k minus one, where you drop the reference category, then you compute the interaction term with x2 for every dummy variable and then you specify a regression with all of these interaction effects and without the main effect of the continuous variable. So the reason why this works is as follows. So here's the standard regression model. We have an intercept b0 for the reference category plus a slope times x1 which here is the continuous predictor plus a slope for the dummy d2, plus a slope for the dummy d3, plus two interaction terms for those two dummies. So in this case we have three groups. One group is subsumed by the reference category. We have two dummies to indicate the difference in intercepts between the reference category and those two other categories. And we have an effect of the continuous variable for the reference category, plus two interactions to represent how the effect differs in those two other categories. But if we instead estimate the following model, where we have the intercept B0 plus B1 times dummy 2 plus B2 times dummy 3, and then interaction effects for all three of the dummy categories, then we have the main effect of K minus 1 dummies, no main effect of X1, and we have k interaction terms, in other words, the effect of x1 for each specific category. So if we do this, we can just look at the regression coefficients table and read off 
the size of the effect of x1 within each of the three categorical groups. If you fill out the formula for each of the groups, you'll figure out how this works. So group 1 scores 0 on both dummy d2 and dummy d3, and if we fill out the formula for them, everything that's multiplied with one of those dummies goes to 0. So we have b0 plus b1 times x1 plus b2 times 0 is 0 plus b3 times 0 is 0 plus b4 times 0 is 0 plus b5 times 0 is 0. So for group 1, the regression formula simplifies to b0 plus b1 times x1. So for anyone in group 1, the intercept is b0 and the slope of x1 is b1. But group 2 scores 1 on dummy 2, and if we fill the formula out for them, we get b0 plus b1 times x1 plus b2 times 1, so they get an extra bump on top of the intercept. This goes to 0, and then b4 times 1 is b4 times x2 times x1, so they also get an extra bump on top of the effect of x1, and then this goes to 0. So for group 2, the formula simplifies to b0 plus b2, that's their intercept, plus b1 plus b4, that's their slope, times x1. And if we compare this to the model that includes three interaction terms, one for each of the groups, then that's calculated slightly differently. So group 1 now scores 1 on the first dummy variable, and if we fill the formula out for them, we see b0 plus b1 times 0 is 0, plus b2 times 0 is 0, plus b3 times 1 times x1. So there is the effect of x1 for group 1. And then these two are both multiplied with 0, so they are cancelled out. And then the regression formula for group 1 is b0 plus b3 times x1. Group 2 scores 1 on dummy 2, so if we fill this formula out for them, then we get b0 plus b1 times 1, so they get an extra bump on top of the intercept, plus b2 times 0 is 0, plus b3 times 0 is 0, plus b4 times 1 times x1, and b4 is their slope for the effect of x1. And b5 also goes to 0, so for group 2, the formula simplifies to b0 plus b1, that's their intercept, plus b4 times x1. So b4 is the effect of x1 for group 2. We can also have interactions with two continuous predictors. The math is all the same, it's just a little bit easier to explain interaction with one dummy, because then you can see these two distinct regression lines in a scatterplot. If we model the interaction between two continuous predictors, there are a few small differences with the preceding example, which included one dummy. So an interaction between one binary and one continuous predictor nicely results in two distinct regression lines, one for each value of the categorical predictor. But if we have an interaction between two continuous predictors, that also gives us a unique regression line for every unique value of each predictor, but of course, because they're continuous variables, they have infinite unique values. So you can kind of think of it as like this fan of potential regression lines with one unique slope for every unique value of the other predictor. So if we have the predictors involvement and warmth as predictors of the outcome variable child adjustment, so this is parental involvement and parental warmth, they're both predicting child adjustment, and there's an interaction between involvement and warmth. So what we see is that for low levels of warmth, the effect of adjustment is pretty flat, but as warmth goes up, the effect of involvement also goes up, and we see the same for warmth. So if you're low on involvement, it doesn't matter how warm you are, but as you get more involved, the effect of warmth becomes more positive. And you can actually think of this in three dimensions as well. So here would be a three-dimensional plot for the effect of work hours and gender role attitudes on parental involvement if there were no interaction between the two. And then you get this flat plane in three dimensions. 
So no matter where we intersect this plane, the slope for gender roles will be the same. And no matter where we intersect this plane, the slope for the effect of work hours will be the same. But if there's an interaction effect, then we have a curved plane in three dimensions. So if we intersect this plane at different values of involvement, we get a different slope for the effect of warmth. And if we intersect this plane at different values of warmth, we get a different slope for the effect of involvement. So this plot also shows that the effect of warmth on adjustment gets more positive as involvement goes up. So for more involved parents, parental warmth is more beneficial for the child. Just like with the example with the binary moderator, we could complete the formula for specific values of the moderator. So let's consider an example where the outcome variable y is parental involvement. The first predictor is gender roles, how progressive the gender roles of the parent are. And the second predictor, x2, is work. How many hours does the parent work? Imagine we found the following coefficients. The predicted value of involvement is equal to an intercept of 12.5 hours plus 1.5 hours for every additional point on gender roles minus 0.2 hours for every point on the variable hours worked plus 0 0.07 times gender roles times work. So there is an interaction between gender roles and work. We might then ask the question, what is the value of the effect of gender roles for someone who works 40 hours, so a full work week? And we can simply fill out the value 40 every time we see the predictor work. So then the formula becomes 12.5 plus 1.5 times x1 minus 0.2 times 40. So we knock off a little bit of the intercept plus 0 0.07 times 40 times x1. And that simplifies to 4.5. So a slightly lower intercept plus 4.3 times x1. So a stronger positive effect of gender roles. Similarly, we might wonder what's the effect of work hours for someone who scores zero on gender roles. And to know the answer, we can just substitute the value zero every time we see x1 in the formula because x1 represents gender roles. So then the formula becomes 12.5 plus 1.5 times zero is zero minus 0.2 times x2 plus 0 0.07 times 0 times x2 goes to 0. So that simplifies to 12.5 minus 0.2 times x2. So the effect of work hours for someone who scores 0 on gender roles is minus 0.2. Centering becomes extremely important for the interpretation of our coefficients when we have an interaction term in the model. Because the effect of x1 now depends on the value of x2 and vice versa, it's really important that those values have a meaningful reference point. If we don't center the variables, coefficients can be very hard to interpret because they may not have a meaningful zero point. Moreover, not centering variables often means that each of the variables goes from zero to some positive number. If you then multiply them, your product term also goes from zero to some very large positive number, and we tend to get artificial multicollinearity between the predictors. If we center the variables, however, we don't introduce artificial multicollinearity, but moreover, the interpretation of the coefficients is much more straightforward. For example, after centering, the intercept A becomes the expected value of the outcome for people who score average on all of the predictors, because you've centered them all around their average value. The slope B1 then becomes the effect of the predictor 1 for people who score average on predictor 2. And the slope B2 becomes the effect of predictor 2 for people who score average on predictor 1. So that's very readily interpretable. 
Of course, we can also do simple slopes analysis when we have continuous predictors. If we observe a significant interaction effect between two continuous predictors, again we might ask, what is the effect of x1 for different values of x2? And with a categorical moderator, we simply obtain the effect of x1 for every unique value of the categorical moderator x2. But with a continuous moderator, we have to pick specific values for x2 because it could theoretically take any possible value on the number line. Remember that I mentioned that interaction effects are by definition symmetrical. But as I explained before, very often we want to interpret them in terms of effect modification. So we assume that the effect of one of them is the effect of interest and that is being modified by the moderator. So mathematically there's no difference between saying the effect of x1 depends on the value of x2 or the effect of x2 depends on the value of x1 because x1 times x2 is the same as x2 times x1. But theory makes the difference. So you can decide which of these variables serves as the modifier of the effect of the other. To perform simple slopes analysis, you can again use centering. Remember that multiple regression gives you the effect of each predictor while keeping all other predictors equal to zero. So by changing the zero value of your moderator, you can get the slope of the other variable for different values of the moderator. And you've actually done this before by centering your variables. You made the zero value equal to the mean of that variable. Like I just explained, if your predictors are all centered at the mean, then regression with an interaction gives you the effect of x1 for people with an average score on x2. But we can play around with what the zero point of the moderator is. If we center to a high value of the moderator or center to a low value of the moderator, then we can get the effect of x1 for people who score high on the moderator or score low on the moderator. So what's very commonly done is to create different copies of the moderator. One of them is centered at the mean, one of them is centered at plus one standard deviation, and one of them is centered at minus one standard deviation. Then for each of those three copies of the moderator, you can calculate the interaction term with the predictor x1. So you have also three versions of the interaction term. And then you can estimate three different regression models. One that looks at the effect of x1 for average values of x2. One that looks at the effect of x1 for people who score one standard deviation above the mean on x2 and one that looks at the effect of x1 for people who score one standard deviation below the mean on x2. So here are the steps to perform such a simple slopes analysis. The first step is that you center all interacting predictors at their mean value. The second step is you calculate the interaction term between the centered predictors. The third step is you check to see whether that interaction term is significant. If it's not significant, you don't have to do simple slopes analysis, you won't learn anything from it. But if it is significant, then you also center the moderator x2 at one standard deviation above the mean. So when you subtract the mean from its original score, you just additionally also subtract one standard deviation from it. You recompute the interaction term with this new recentered variable and you run an interaction and look at the effect of x1 at this particular level of x2. Then you repeat steps four until six. Now you also center x2 at minus one standard deviation, recompute the interaction term with that recentered variable and look at the effect of x1 for this level of x2. When you interpret the three effects of x1 that you've now obtained, there's something very important to keep in mind. When you want to center at plus one standard deviation, you have to subtract the mean plus one additional standard deviation to get the centered variable. And that works as follows. So the black normal distribution here is the distribution of your variable centered at zero. The people who score plus one standard deviation below the mean are here. 
If I want to slide those people over to be my zero point, I don't add a standard deviation. I subtract the standard deviation to slide this whole distribution to the left. And then I get this red distribution. So hopefully you'll see that for the red distribution, I subtracted the mean minus one standard deviation. And that put the people who score at plus one standard deviation as my new zero point. If I want to make the people who scored minus one standard deviation below the mean my new zero point, then I actually subtract the mean but add one standard deviation. And then I get the blue distribution. So you see, to get this blue distribution, I add plus one standard deviation and that puts the people who score one standard deviation below the mean at zero. So to sum this up, when you do simple slopes analysis with continuous variables and you want to know the effect of predictor x1 for people who score one standard deviation above the mean on x2, then you first center x2 at zero and then subtract one more standard deviation, not add it. So the interpretation is flipped. Another important thing to remember is that every time you change how a variable is centered, you have to recompute the interaction term. So the interaction term is only valid if it is calculated out of the two other variables that you include in your regression model. So you have to always make sure that your interaction term is computed from the other two terms that are in your model. If you use syntax, it's much easier to prevent mistakes and to keep track of the steps that you've taken. That's all you need to know about interaction terms in the general linear model. Make sure to get lots of practice and I'll see you in the tutorials. Good luck.